G'day ladies and gents, and welcome back to War Thunder. War Thunder, for the most part, is a fairly decent game. I've basically managed to sink something like 9,000 hours into this game, uh, and I don't regret any of it. I think most of that time has been fairly well spent, because the game itself is not too bad at its core. Of course there are issues, but sometimes this particular game just makes you have a look at it, take a step back, take a big breath in, and go, what the fuck? There are three particular matches that I'm going to show you here today that just made me take a step back and say those exact same words. Of course, War Thunder is a land, sea, and air game. And all three of these matches just so happen to be in British vehicles, on the land, in the ocean, and in the air. My god, strap yourselves in. And of course, if you don't want to have a look at, say, uh, one particular type of gameplay, of course, there will be timestamps in the uh, video description below so that you don't have to sort of slug through or find a game that you don't really want to watch. Anyway, this is the VMF5 or VFM5, I can't quite remember. Uh, it's a tank that we've really needed in the game for a very long time. Sits in the British tree at 9.0 as a light tank. Has an L7, or basically an L7 gun, with, uh, I can't quite remember what round, uh, but there is, it's, it's similar to DM23 uh, or 33, I can't quite remember. Basically, it pens things, it's APFSDS, it's good enough, and it is the round that you are going to be wanting to use. Uh, that is the fully upgraded round, not the uh, stock, I, I think it's stock heat FS, you don't want to be using that, unless, of course, you come across something that you desperately need to hull break. Now, on this map, I've managed to get myself a very advantageous position early on in the match, which is uh, really, really good for surprising your opponents. That north spawn is basically loser POV, and if you don't push through here quick enough, uh, you're not going to secure your, um, I guess, your loser POV um, confirmation, if you will. If you don't sort of, like go for the cheeky spots, uh, if you don't push this area early, uh, you actually have a chance of losing this. So now that I've done this, as long as I can secure it, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to have a chance at at least smashing through this match, and that's exactly what happens here. This particular match, I get this spot, and I don't know how, but I managed to pull off some really whack stuff. So I'm basically just waiting, biding my time. I'm probably using the wrong shell here on this Radkamp wagon. Uh, it surprisingly has a fair amount of armor, actually. It's, you know, no armor, best armor, but the steep angles on the turret really do make that tank a uh, fairly, fairly, you know, tanky thing, if you will. Although I do manage to put one into the roof of the turret and take out one of the guys in there. I see a uh, C2 Mexus, or an Alexis Texas Mexus, as I like to call it, and I manage to breach him. He's going to probably pop some smoke if he panics enough, but I'm going to reload in time, go for the shot straight through the ammunition, and there's... Oh, that's basically all she wrote. Now, I have almost gotten to the end of my lifespan here, because I've come across a little, uh, little friendly Leopard 1A1. Now, I somehow bounced that shot, I don't know how... And thankfully, I have a friendly here who has some smoke for me to cower behind, and I managed to get behind just in time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit behind him. He's got the better gun. He's got the uh, better armor. He's got the better reload rate, and I'm going to just re uh, sort of repair behind him. I'm very confident that he'll be able to take out this leopard when it gets uh, into the into the correct spot. And the terms, I think it's terms T decides to push ahead and have a little go at this leopard who's uh, damaged him, he's probably tracked him, or he's uh, done something else to him. So I'm going to finish off my repair and I'm going to push. I know that he has fired, so what I'm going to do is go straight for that barrel. No bullshit, I'm going to take out the cannon barrel, and now that gives me free reign on whatever I want with the uh, L44. Unfortunately though, he gets taken out by the XM1, which is not a bad thing. I do want some uh, some teamwork here, and if we, can, we have to share a kill for that, then uh, so be it. Again, I'm going to push up. There is a Leopard 1, as in a Leopard 1. I think I think it's supposed to be like a Leopard 1A0, but like, like a pre-production version of the Leopard 1 without its stabilizer. But first, I see a uh, Werbelwind. Goodbye to Mr. Werbelwind here. Does not have any reason to be in this battle rating. Uh, and of course, I see the Leopard 1, who has actually managed to deal a little bit of damage. 
I'm going to shoot here for the top of the engine bay because I know that is going to collect as many crew as possible. Uh, it's going to sort of go over the engine and all the spalling is going to sort of uh, head in that direction. So as you can see, we've basically managed to steamroll the enemy team. Part of that was due to the map being fairly biased towards uh, <laughs> towards the, the southern side, but it's also because we managed to get that advantageous position fairly early on. Uh, the Radkamp, I think, it's uh, that's the guy that I managed to spot, but uh, apparently not. That doesn't matter for me. I'm going to sort of bide my time. I think there's someone else up there, as you can see by the little, uh, little square that is denoting that I've spotted someone. So I'm not going to really push. Uh, out into the open. I don't want to risk my tank. I also don't want to risk anyone coming from the spawn because that could be potentially hazardous for a tank like me with uh, as little as two crew. I also have to replenish my ready rack so I guess that's some fairly ample time to do so. So what am I going to do next? I basically have to either wait for this guy to get taken out or I have to sort of wait for someone else to push with me so that we have uh, more than one target here and the XM1 is the perfect guy to do that with the XM1, whilst not being incredibly tanky, is actually fairly viable uh, and can absorb one or two shots on occasion. Not only that, but it's fairly fast and it has a fairly rapid firing gun. So I'm going to basically move up from my uh, original position of cover to this one here. I spot the uh, L44, but I can just barely see the top of him. So I'm not really going to fire. I'm not going to risk the, uh, the shot. But however, the uh, scouting has allowed me to uh, get a little bit of, uh, you know, scouting points. The VMF-5 is actually really good for that. I absolutely adore this tank, uh, and I'm so glad that it has come to the game in this sort of capacity. Uh, it, it just it just seems to work for me. I, I quite like it. Um, and of course, the L44 there dies to a uh, lovely little... Uh, I actually can't read what it is on the uh, on the screen. I think it's terms T, but they end up dying to a friendly because of the scouting, which is really really nice. Again, I scout a uh, another leopard, and he gets taken out. So we're basically looking at a fairly productive game here. Plenty of kills, plenty of scouts, and of course, uh, the best is yet to come. We've absolutely steamrolled the enemy team here. It's Absolutely crazy. This map is not only a little bit crap, but uh, in this particular case, Leopard 1s aren't exactly suited for city combat, and it looks like the enemy team hadn't spotted me in time, as well as the Terms T, the XM1, and myself pushing up very early in the game. You can kind of do a reverse sweep, uh, as in going from north to south with uh, a victory, but it is a lot harder, and one of the things that you will need to do is you will need to push into that little area there that is uh, like with the little houses, little sort of alleyways and side streets, you will need to push into that fairly early and you will need to get lucky, which kind of ruins the whole purpose of that particular uh, battle rating. Or that, that rather that map design. So uh, yeah, M41 at this battle rating really got no place. It shouldn't be there. Uh, well, you shouldn't be driving it out there. Surely there are better things that you have in the lineup. Um, but the craziest thing is not yet to come. I'm just going to casually sit, make sure there's someone not coming from their spawn, and then I hear an aeroplane. I see the gunfire, I take aim in third person, and what the fuck was that shot? <laughs> I don't know, for me, that makes this match absolutely batshit crazy. Just that shot alone, oh, oh my god, man, I, oh, I was, I had to put the keyboard and mouse down for a second, it was, it was kind of nuts. Anyway, ladies and gents, on to the next match we have here. Some fun in Naval. Yes, that's right. Naval in itself is a bit of a what-the-fuck moment. But we have here the uh, the J-Class, which is, you know, it's not bad. But I've put some torps out. I've gotten a couple of kills. And unfortunately for me, I've been basically swarmed on the sea cap there or on the, on the northern cap with uh, enemy destroyers. Now, 4.3 arcade ships actually isn't too bad. I could kind of get used to it. There are obviously some downsides, like uh, you know, getting all those weird open maps. Uh, obviously, there are many issues with naval that I just I, I don't want to go into too many of them. But everything from AA to the aiming system to map design, there are just too many to name. Maybe I'll get along a couple of them when we have a little bit of a, a dead spot, if you will. But um, <laughs> yeah, there's our there's our first one. So uh, a torpedo kill for the J-Class, where I released torpedoes early on, and a gun kill on the Clemson, and we have another Clemson to kill, so plenty more where that came from. 
This particular Clemson is getting showered by uh, a couple of little 120mm guns, and this uh, ship has four of them in the front turret and two of them in the aft turret, as well as a set of four torpedoes. But that's not really the the remarkable part of this ship. It's got plenty of AA armament. It has 102mm guns that can equip themselves with that uh, VT fuse shell, which is absolutely busted. Torpedoes in the water, I'm going to do a little bit of some uh, torpedo beats here. Very, very narrowly dodging that torpedo, heading for my aft section there. Holy shit. Naval Arcade is a lot of fun just because of torpedoes. I honestly, honestly, I, I quite like Naval AB. It's, it's better than Naval RB in my opinion. I think it's just better. Uh, it's a bit more fast paced and there is a little bit more, um, you know, there's a little bit more fun had to it. Anyway, uh, this particular ship here, this lovely little uh, Type 1934 is getting a hail of 120mm uh, shells and of course some more torpedoes in the water means that I will have to take evasive action. Having a look at that little torpedo there coming again for the aft section is pretty spooky. Uh, but just as I put the, <laughs> put the uh, gun down onto this Type 1934, I managed to dodge everything and of course I managed to just repair everything, put out all the fires and stop all of the flooding all at once. So once that's done, it's time to lay down a little bit more fire on this Clemson here who's falling into the water. Of course, they only have a 100 and uh, I think it's a 120 millimeter gun or 105 millimeter gun. The Clemson is one of the saddest little destroyers you will ever come across. Honestly, I don't know why it's 3.7 or 3.3. It should be lower. Uh, it could probably be 3.0 and could be just like super tanky. Honestly, not too bad. Not a bad start. We're looking uh, at... <laughs> A fair amount of action already in the first couple of minutes here, and it's time for a little bit more. <laughs> so, we're going to be mopping up this Frunz, and the Frunz has, again, a really, really shit gun. It's only got one or two, I think, at the uh, at the front. It's kind of like the Clemson, uh, and it really doesn't have a business being uh, up against things like a Hyder. Now, one thing that I find interesting or kind of sad about Naval is that it is kind of a battle of uh, who can drag out the most hit points and who can just sort of soak in the most shots straight away. One of the things you will find is that generally the bigger destroyers will win and I I don't know, I don't really like it. I wish it was a little bit different. Um, but at least with Arcade you can see everyone. You know, There's no... I don't know. I, f I find it a lot better. It's a little bit faster paced and the aiming system for me is a little bit better. Speaking of aiming system, the Type 1924 here is going to be victim to some 120mm shells from my aiming system. Absolutely destroyed there. And uh, I guess we can very, very cleanly take that northern cap. All that's left is the fronts, which is sitting there behind the smoke. And of course, we will get a couple more respawns from that northern spawn point. Holy crap, this is turning out to be one hell of a naval match already, and we're like barely halfway through. So... Here comes some more interesting stuff. We have the, uh, of course, that uh, Heinkel 111 who's sort of sitting behind, and this smoke screen disappears on the poor little Franz. Oh no, it is just, ah, oh, it's so sad. This poor, this poor ship is just, it doesn't deserve this much, <laughs> this much fire heading towards it. Poor little Russian destroyer, obviously not going to survive for much longer. Not only are there three enemy ships, but there are three ships that are higher battle rating and it's caught out in the open. If it's not going to get killed by guns like it was here, it's going to get killed by torpedoes. Uh, and speaking of torpedoes, there is a motor torpedo boat, a Higgins PT, which is an absolute joke of a thing. It, I don't know why you'd be up here. Unfortunately, I didn't end up getting any shots onto it, uh, but that's okay. I'm going to switch to the VT fuse and uh, try and get myself that Heinkel 111, a kind of little juicy kill if I can get my hands on it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get anything, and uh, more torpedoes heading straight towards me. Now, at this point, I should have released my torpedoes, uh, but that's okay. No big deal. So, what I'm going to do, I've noticed that the two southernmost caps are being taken, or have been taken, and I need to take them back. So, whilst my Heinkel uh, 111, or my uh, Heido is opening up on the Heinkel 111, beautiful. I, I don't need any skill whatsoever to do that. <laughs> which is kind of bullshit, let's be real. 
I'm basically just going to traverse the uh, terrain a little bit, head towards the, uh, I think it's the sea cap, and uh, hopefully I can sort of sway the tickets back. One of the things that I do have to bring up with naval is the fact that the ticket bleed is so damn fast. You can't really sort of get to positions and take them. If you're, if you're in naval, you kind of commit to one cap circle, which is kind of sad because there are three cap circles. I mean, at least if you could commit to two, that would be ideal. Um, but for me, having that ticket bleed lowered would be a really good start. Um, or alternatively, having more tickets. Uh, anyway, there's no time for that. There is a Type 1924 Leopard that has just taken a little bit of a barrage and now manages to have its uh, transmission taken out, which means that I have to do something about this. It's uh, 1924, it's battle rating 3.7. I think it has three 105s, and what I decided to do originally was to try and go full circle, but I realized that I would have the island blocking my way, uh, and of course, if I tried to go back the other way, I would have the other island, so I end up sort of going in a little bit of a roundabout way to uh, try and get myself around in front of the Type 1924, but I spot another, uh, another destroyer coming out of the woodwork here, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a wee woo moment here. I'm a little bit a little bit frightened, a little bit uh, shocked, if you will, that I have two enemy destroyers to deal with. Uh, and the Type 1924 is uh, looking pretty sad. He does have his guns pointed towards me, but I should be able to dispatch of this guy pretty quickly if I uh, play my cards right. I managed to basically take him out there without much of a fuss uh, and just in time to sort of get my ship ready for. Uh, for, for a very, very spooky episode indeed. The Heinkel 111 obviously goes down. Uh, who would have thought that uh, automatic gunners were very nice and balanced? So, whilst I'm dealing with the aircraft here, getting sort of interested in them, the uh, enemy, sh enemy uh, destroyer that was originally there decides he wants to come around and uh, do some damage. You'll see him in a second and he will pop up on the map. But I've sort of been trying to just navigate these islands for now, and there it is, Nipe, type, Nipe, type 1924 Leopard, just sitting there out in the open. He realizes his mistake as well, he's popped out on a hider, and of course I'm going to launch some torpedoes. He's going to launch some torpedoes, and it's just a matter of who can get out of the way of the torpedoes fast enough. I just escape once more, and I manage to torpedo the 1924. Again what the fuck is going on with this match. This, I genuinely am blown away by <laughs> the absolute shit that I've managed to get away with in this match. I don't know how I managed to do it. Is it pure luck? Is it just, I'm in a premium and Gaijin has given me the, the so-called premium luck, if you will. Um, obviously that's not real, but uh, you know, it's nice to joke about, I suppose. <laughs> oh boy. Some of you might have wondered why the hell I was playing naval in the first place. And the answer is quite simple. Uh, I quite like decals and I quite like uh, decorators. Decorators especially. If you, uh, if you asked me to grind out a million RP for decorators, I would grab the most overpowered premium plane and sweat for a week to get that thing. I absolutely love getting uh, decorators and decals in War Thunder. Uh, especially being part of the content partner program, we can basically ask for almost whatever premium vehicle or whatever vehicle that we like. So. Whilst the grind isn't an issue, uh, things that come up, like uh, events with limited time rewards, especially for decorators and decals and camouflages, um, especially the uh, New Year smoke, I just absolutely had to go for that, especially considering that I am in a fairly privileged position. Um, it also give, gives me something to grind, which is really, really nice. And uh, although I didn't want to play naval, I kind of kind of did it, kind of had to do it for this uh, thing. And of course, back to the gameplay, we have a Corsair coming in absolutely nice and hot. He's going to bomb us, undoubtedly. There goes the uh, the bomb, and uh, it's not looking pretty for us. That was very close. That was very close. If I had uh, if I had not moved out of the way, we probably would have been taken out. That would have been a very, uh, very serious amount of damage. And I already have a lot of damage done to me in this ship. You can see most of my compartments are blacked out. Uh, and one of the things I would like to see, again, talking about things that could be potentially improved in uh, War Thunder Naval, is an uh, ability to sort of get your crew back or to get your compartments back. Uh, to sort of undo critical damage to your ship. That would be something that is uh, extremely nice. Now, 
to uh, sort of wrap up the last bit of the, uh, if you will, the naval content. Uh, War Thunder's naval content is, uh, whilst a little bit uh, dodgy, a little bit monka s if you will, uh, you know what, it can be fun at times, and I think Naval Arcade is a really, really good game mode, uh, considering that Naval RB exists. Honestly, I think it's not too bad, and if you have a 3.3 uh, or a 3.7 or a 4.3, uh, it is definitely worth giving these particular ships a go. Honestly, it's not too bad. It could be worse, um, but there are certain issues that don't really arise in uh, Naval RB. One thing I really like is having lots of torpedoes. And speaking of torpedoes, I managed to uh, take out, uh, I think it's a Moskva, which is the, uh, I think it's a 4.3 destroyer. And uh, <laughs> that more or less wraps up my Reign of Terror on uh, Naval RB. I don't know how I got away with this absolute rubbish, uh, but here we go again. Just about to exert my wrath here on a poor little uh, Mutsuki. Mutsuki is uh, a pretty, pretty low battle rating uh, destroyer, and you can see it's only a matter of time before I finish this guy off. And uh, I hear, I hear the bomb, and uh, I think the the contact of the bomb contacting my uh, my hull or something like that manages to kill my. Uh, <laughs> my stuff but uh, unfortunately we lose that which is an extra what the fuck moment but hey at least at least at least i got my christmas tree all right the christmas tree that's all that matters now on to the final creme de la creme of what the fuck thunder <laughs> we're in the fgr2 the final thing to wrap it up we have a british top tier jet and if you want me to see uh or want me to make a video on this jet uh do let me know but this particular match sort of starts out fairly ordinary. I've got myself an F4E in my sights with an AIM-9D. The AIM-9D is a fairly unremarkable missile, although it is fairly okay. It does tend to get swept up by flares very, very easily. The, uh, the, the AIM-9D has like a 16G overload, I think it is. It tracks fairly well, and it is sort of more meant for those higher altitude type engagements. F-104A here comes in, I basically slot in right behind him without any issue at all. The F-104A overcooks himself very much so, and at this type of speed there is really no disengaging from a missile like that. There's no way you can get away from it, and the uh, F-104A is one of those planes that does do a heckin' suffer. Now, onto the next particular spot here, we have an F-4E an F4E and an F4EJ coming in hot. I noticed that I don't have the time to get an AIM-7 off because it does have that one kilometer travel distance uh, and it wouldn't have uh, nearly reached the target in time. So I decide instead to put the nose down and go for a little bit of speed, hopefully pop a few flares in order to get uh, an enemy off my six and uh, you never know, maybe I'll get myself a couple of cheeky kills here. So the uh, a little bit of a battle ensues there over by the uh, by the other side of the island, and I manage to get myself an AIM 9J heading straight for my booty. Popping a few flares though does the trick very very easily. Now I notice that this Phantom uh, is basically going to run me down, and I need to do something about it. I know I can beat the F4E on the deck, but I won't be able to outrun all of his missiles, and of course the F4EJs will soon join. So I'm going to initiate a bit of a dogfight here. I'm going to put myself into a little bit of a rolling scissors if I can, uh, popping my air brake when it's appropriate, using my afterburner again when it's appropriate. You can see here I've turn my afterburner off in order to stop any missiles as well as to sort of force that overshoot to make sure that my opponents don't uh, sort of get themselves behind me. First target here is the F4EJ, I'm going to spray a little bit, I set him on fire, another EJ decides that he wants to go around for some rolling scissors but overcooks it, absolutely ridiculous and I managed to get behind him. A bit of an ambitious missile there. If I guess if it was an R60 or something, I would have come through. And then I noticed the F4E is literally sitting right in front of me. What in the world is going on? These guys could have had me very, very easily, and instead they balked every single engagement. The F4EJ there that is in a flat spin because of the fire uh, is not really having a great time. And the F4EJ that I managed to crit is either damaged because of his engine or damaged because of his airframe and he's not producing nearly the amount of lift that he otherwise would be. He launches a last ditch attempt ambitious missile and it looks like it might be his airframe. 
that's uh, suffering from damage here. You can see that he can't quite pitch up to me, and that might be because he can't quite generate the lift to sort of get up and, uh, you know, get some speed. He bails out, very wise decision, because he would have otherwise have been missile food. And that, that kind of wraps it up for what the hell just happened. I, I just sort of stopped and thought, what the fuck has just happened? These three phantoms should have had me. They should have absolutely destroyed me. Yet somehow I managed to come out on top. And that might have just been the power of Gaijin's luck. Ladies and gentlemen, War Thunder is a great game. But every now and then it just makes you say, what the fuck? This particular match in, in especially, I, I'm lost. I'm totally lost as to how I managed to record it. How I managed to even, even get this particular situation. But you know what? I'm not going to complain. Four kills in the FGR2, which is a suffer box. I am going to take every little ounce of that. And I'm also going to take every little ounce of battle pass points. I managed to unlock another little thing for the battle pass. I'm absolutely breezing through these. I love it. I have to do a full review on the battle pass. Let me know if you want that. Let me know if you want the FGR2 review in the comment section below. That is extremely important. Thank you so much for watching, ladies and gents. And of course, uh, if you if you enjoy the video and would like to feed the algorithm, leave a like, leave a comment. Those things always help me out a ton. Anyway, ladies and gents, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.